All right. Hello, everyone. I am Alex Lim, your host, and welcome to Author Story, the home of authors and stories that matter. This is a bit of a different episode. This episode's featured guest is Lee Cronback, and uh, we won't be talking to an author as we, about a book, as we usually do, but we will be speaking with a musician about his life, his music, and his experiences, or at least as much of that as we can cover in half an hour, because I'm sure there's a lot. So, Lee, welcome to Author Story. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Alex. You're welcome. Well, first off, can you tell us a little bit about your background, you know, how you, like, uh, how you grew up and how you got into music? Okay. Um, I'll try to be fast here. I'm Jewish. Okay. And there's basically several different types of Jews. There's the very orthodox or, like, fundamentalist Christian. Right. And then there's very liberal, radical who don't, who are atheists, mm-hmm. and can be very left wing. My mm-hmm. parents and my fa- my family on both sides came from the liberal radical background. They mm-hmm. did not believe in God. Um, however, they did a lot of good things, both for Jews trying to escape in the United States mm-hmm. back in the 1900s and 1920s. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then they also got involved in helping the cause of black freedom in the United States or, you know, mm-hmm. early members of the NAACP, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Because of their background, we had, while my mother's main preference was classical music, we also had a Duke Ellington record of a tone parallel to Harlem and Liberian Suite. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that just, you know, that just sent me, and I loved Mozart, but then I heard Schultz, and I loved him even more. Um, okay was a huge uh, influence on me. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, the next influence was my older brother by two years. You see, because we were Jews, but non-believing Jews, uh-huh. living in a neighborhood that was, aside from us, 100% Italian Catholic and white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Protestant. Okay. We were like outcast. And, and I was sort of autistic anyway, and I just uh, had no one to talk to. So I'd follow my brother around, because my brother was on the football team, so he got his status. And mm-hmm. uh, he dressed in the classic early 1950s hipster, being very cool about everything black, because on the football team there was a lot of black guys, you know. Right. And then what happened was my next, uh, well, my introduction introduction to black culture um and the mother was a super chef and she made the most wonderful chocolate cake with vanilla icing you know the mm-hmm. icing was like a statue right 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 and there and help wash the dishes we got to lick the bowl in other words take a spoon and eat all the leftover icing right now while we were in there washing dishes and licking the bowl my brother would have the radio on to new york city's first and at that time only, I think, R&B station, WLIB, Liberty, W Liberty. And right. uh, so we got turned into Rhythm and Blues. It was also the first place well, was Presley was played. And then one day we got home a little early and we discovered right before this show was the gospel train, Earl Boston's uh-huh. train. And he got the real gospel music. And when I heard that, whoa, that just totally sent me, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, then, when I was around 11 years old, I was hanging out, I was ostracized by most of the kids there because my parents were left-wing. When they found out I didn't believe in the Easter Bunny, they knew uh-huh. I must be a communist. Okay. And so I was isolated <laughs> from the world, except for this one black family that lived in a little group of four houses where the original black families of our town were. Mm. And uh, once I've been hanging out with this guy, Carl Andrews, for uh, three or four years, when I was around 11, his mother happened to mention that I was Jewish. I said, what? I'm what? Really? I said, I went home, asked my mother, hey, am I, are we Jewish? And she reluctantly said yes, because she really mm-hmm. wanted Scottish, mm-hmm. descendant of the Scottish king, you know. Right. <laughs> but at the time I was Jewish, and then later on, you know, I was sent to a Quaker high school, because that was sort of non-denominational. But along there, in that school, was a young woman who was very fervent Zionist. Mm-hmm. She's now professor of Judaism in Cambridge in England. Mm-hmm. And so she took me under her wing and said, it doesn't, at the time I wasn't sure if I was there or not. She said, Lee, it doesn't matter, but you should be aware of your Judaism. And she loaned me, you know, textbooks of the Hebrew yeah, alphabet. Right. Hey, okay. 
uh, textbooks of the Hebrew alphabet. She's mm -hmm. on the, uh, you know, Martin Buber storybooks. But one time, uh, Martin Buber wrote these stories about these very, well, you'd have to say Christ-like Hasidic rabbis, you know, who are just always loving and forgiving and helping people out and finding ways, you know, that if the illiterate Jewish boy could only play one note on a flute played with all his art, that was more mm -hmm. pleasing to the Lord than all of our written prayers, that type of thing, right? Right, there right. Hippies who didn't do drugs or other sex. <laughs> the Hasidic rabbis. So I'm reading the stories out of a book that Dr. Malone me of the Hasidic rabbis, and at the same time, my brother's blasting out the gospel train. Uh -huh. And it's clicked, and I said, Wow, I believe in God. I really do. I really uh -huh. do. <laughs> and uh, that's important because in a certain sense, almost all my music became religious. Meanwhile, <laughs> what happened, then I followed my, my brother. He started going to the Apollo Theater. And then my father was an artist. Uh -huh. So he took to Skowhegan, Maine. And there I was no longer isolated, but I was hanging out with all sorts of cool people. Uh -huh. People who lived, became members of famous hippie bands in San Francisco, artists and so on. And so I start taking the train from our little suburb into Manhattan, mm -hmm. go down to Greenwich Village and see my the hippie friends who are like much older than me. Mm -hmm. And then I go all the way uptown to Harlem to the Apollo Theater and see this incredible show, Ray Charles and everybody else like that, mm -hmm. you know. And then uh, as I was gay, when I turned around 16 or 17, I'd stop in Midtown to uh, have wild anonymous sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, then, uh, then I uh, went to college, and like everybody in the middle sixties, I wound up going to Cal to Berkeley to, mm -hmm. to the Bay Area, and and mm -hmm. I loved the Bay Area. I was no longer ostracized. I was a I was a hero. I was an image of how everyone should be. You know, right. it was great friends. It was uh, parties every day, mm -hmm. and it was black and white together fighting for freedom, you know, and, yeah. uh, and then, um, I stopped taking piano lessons because my mother had made me take lessons with a very classically pers person who wouldn't let me do any jazz or even rock or mm -hmm. pop or anything. Right. So I, I just made up my own type of music uh -huh. and, uh, with the free spirit of the Bay Area then, that resulted in my first recording. Mm -hmm. Luna Sexwell. I have like two or three links, clips on my YouTube music site. Right. right. And uh, most of it was just a whole lot of people playing a whole lot of notes at once. Uh -huh. I was aiming for something a little different. A whole lot of people playing music notes, mm -hmm. you know, little melody phrases that would somehow fit together. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we made the record, the record bombed at the time. Oddly mm -hmm. enough, I thought it was gone. Now, this record was made in 1966, right? Mm -hmm. By 1967, the record producers said, look, this is a, do a dog. It sold 300 copies. Forget it. Well, right. <laughs> two years ago, here in the 21st century, it suddenly started appearing on the Internet. Uh -huh. Old copies and then um, of the actual vinyl for sale and then right. the various uh, co clips of the uh, recordings of the songs. Right. And... Uh, and so I got that up there. Um, meanwhile, this next group, unfortunately, all the recordings were on cassette tapes, and cassette tapes all die the death the cassette tapes die. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, CDs die too, I discovered. You know, CDs have a, they die after, yeah. a, you know, CD rot. And then cassette tapes, uh, this one guy was trying to, later trying to transfer music from cassette tape to uh, CDs. Mm -hmm. And as he played the cassette tape through the machine, all of the surface of the tape fell off. You could see a little pile of brown. Oh, okay. <laughs> that means goodbye. Right. Anyway, so, so this group was called the Cosmic Playboys. I mm -hmm. put an ad local underground paper. And mm -hmm. the first person to answer was my first really great drummer, mm -hmm. a guy named uh, EJ. Don't know mm -hmm. his whole name. Played drums for Jackie Wilson and other guys when they came into town. I'll be R and B stars, mm -hmm. and he was from Oakland. And he said, "Well, I want to play what you crazy hippies and see what you guys are up to," you know. Mm -hmm. And he was my first absolutely wonderful genius uh -huh. from another mother drummer, you know. <laughs> right. And um, and then we put together the most interesting band. Um, 
very unusual lineup. There were him on drums, me on piano, a guy named Joe Friedman who played flamenco guitar, mm -hmm. Spanish flamenco guitar. And then there was a, a Mormon businessman who drove all the way from Reno because he loved doing the music so much who played cello, bow mm -hmm. cello, mm -hmm. and a three-piece suit. So here's EJ looking, you know, Jack, Jackie Wilson, 60s cool, uh, the hippie me, and then this guy in the uh, three-piece suit playing cello. Mm -hmm. And then we had two flute players who were late teens. They both had huge giant afros. One was black, one was white. And uh, they played, both played flute. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, tr a Jewish trombone player who was a follower of Transcendental Meditation. And um, that, uh, that was the main group. Mm. Cosmic Playboys. Cosmic right. for Berkeley, Playboys for Oakley. Right. And, uh, and I mean, and, and it kind of grew since there, I mean, right? I mean, you've gotten into, from there, you've gotten into different kinds of music. You've gotten to, as you mentioned, church, you've gotten to jazz, rock, and R&B. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you've gotten well, to a whole bunch of things. Right. Okay, so let me go quickly, more quickly now. Um, after the Pimps broke up, or the Cosmic Playboy broke up, then I wound up joining in a rock, a couple rock bands. I finally got a really pretty good rock band called Chambray. Mm. We played some of the top rock hippie dance halls of the Bay Area. We mm -hmm. were playing all the time. Right. It was a lot of fun. And um, once again, the tapes died. But and then the thing is, suddenly after my years of being an ostracized outcast of a teenager, I was a, a local hero. People were asking me for my autograph, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and as a result, uh, the hippie movement, what it was, I had my choice of both sex and drugs every single day of the week, mm -hmm. starting with balls at nine in the morning, you know. And at first I said, this is great. And I said, wait a minute, I'm burning myself out. If I stay here, I'm going to be dead. Mm -hmm. And then a close friend of mine, who I'd been briefly, Frosty Furman, he uh, had gone to Wyoming, become a country rock guy, and now he was going to Berkeley School of Music in Boston. Mm -hmm. I said... I should just forget this whole Bay Area scene, go to Boston, study music, and, and save my life because I'm sure it's a lot more conservative. And it right. certainly was, you know. And so uh, I joined up with Frosty and uh, his country western band, and we played all these really interesting low-class biker bars, blue-collar, working stiff bars, gay bars, and... Um, now, this is where, if we have time, I can tell you the Duke Ellington story. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Okay. So, uh, I was gay, so I got a jobs in the gay circuit. Mm -hmm. Now, I was going to Berkeley School of Music, and a guy there um, had been a uh, roadie for the Duke Ellington band, and he himself was gay, mm -hmm. and he knew a member of the Duke band was gay. Mm -hmm. So, they had to visit us one night when we were playing the gay bar and that happened to be the night when we were really serious for a week we didn't do any grass at all or anything or drink anything we just exercised and practiced exercise and practice study music theory when we were too tired to exercise everybody in the band so when right. they got there we were playing our absolute best and mm -hmm. we're feeling great about it they walked in at midnight when we were feeling better and better we did the song gloria i don't know if G-L-O-R-I-A, Gloria. And we were each soloing, and each solo was better than last. The very last song, solo, Brent Mark Moyer, who, by the way, now has been working in Nashville, in Country Western, called himself mm -hmm. the Global Cowboy. He goes around. He's one of maybe the only country guy I know of who made uh, songs defending illegal immigrants for being here, you know. Mm -hmm. He wrote the story of poor Maria, who was so beloved by everybody and did such great work and she was forced out by the immigration and her family destroyed and how, you know, classically horrible, sad country story. Um, but anyway, so when they, when this guy walked in, they saw us playing our absolute best and the guy said, okay, you got to be Duke Ellington's guest tomorrow. He's playing at the <laughs> Ball Ball Jazz Club. Okay, so right. I went in there. Now, if you know, if you read about Duke Ellington, you know that he hated country and western. Mm -hmm. Because in his, that was the music of the Ku Klux Klan. That was the lynch mob music. Right. He was, he was very nasty. He was opposed to that. And he didn't like rock and roll. He thought those were 
bad musicians who can barely play. Right. You know, talk about the Rolling Stones over. So here we are. We're invited in. We're all these raggedy, redneck hippies from a okay. country band. And so he meets us, and he acts like we were his long-lost grandchildren. Uh -huh. he, he had a way of shaking hands. He put both hands around your hand and hold it, and he would look at you. Now, Duke Ellington, I'd read all the books about him by then, and mm -hmm. I knew he was famous for having incredible insight. He could look at a person for one minute and tell you almost everything about him. Wow. And somehow he looked at us, and he knew that we were a serious musician, whatever, mm -hmm. even if we were people. So he said, tonight, you are my guests. You are the band's guests. So you don't pay anything for anything. Wow. You sit here at the band table with the rest of the band, talk to any of you band members you might want to learn anything from, and whatever mm -hmm. we have with yours for tonight. Mm -hmm. And I said, that particular night, Wild Bill Davis, an organ player, considered the father of jazz organ, like Jimmy Smith, mm -hmm. was playing. Going to I said, I'd love to sit behind Wild Bill Davis. I mean, let me just see what he's doing and adjusting his organ stops. Right. And so Duke immediately snapped his fingers. Somebody came up with a chair, put it right behind poor Wild Bill. I'm sure he didn't enjoy me sitting there for an hour, but <laughs> Duke wanted, so that's what happened. So for an hour, I got to from about two feet away, see everything his hands and settings are doing. Wow. Then, when that's over, we all go sit down at the band table, and suddenly, in walks in, this procession of around eight to ten Boston, they must have been high society ladies, because they were wearing, you know, incredibly expensive white satin and silk dresses. Mm -hmm. uh, and each of them was carrying a silver salver. That's like, you see these movies, you know, this giant silver platter and then there's a giant round cover on top of it right mm, yeah yeah so, so each of them is carrying a silver salver with a platter all eight or nine of them you know and they bring them all down to the band table and take off those covers and each platter had a different type of delicacy expensive delicacy mm -hmm. mignon steak asparagus hollandaise the cheese tray of course um, et cetera, et cetera, lobster, quail, everything you can think of, you know. Right. So we, I pass around, we eat all that. Then, who should walk in but John Coltrane's old drummer, Elvin Jones. Coltrane had passed by then. All right. dressed up. He says hello to take, Duke. Mm -hmm. And then after that, Duke says, now I'm going to play a solo piano piece dedicated to my fathers and forefathers mm -hmm. who were much greater men than me. Mm -hmm. And then he says, down there, and he plays a five-minute piano solo like nothing I've ever heard in my life on any mm -hmm. of or anybody. They he combined all the different styles of music. It seemed like with classical, it was jazz, it was African, it was right. Latin, it was everything, all coming together. Right. So, uh, and then we went home, and and we just felt so encouraged by that. The way he shook our hands and the said, we had this incredible self-confidence. A week later. We have, were hired by a booking agent. We're certainly actually making money. No more, mm -hmm. no more brown rice and hamburger helper. <laughs> you know? Right. right. <laughs> so that's my Duke Ellington story. So how much time do I have left? Uh, we still we still have a few more minutes. So about 10, 15 more minutes. Yes. Okay. Well, I've got to tell you then about drum circles. Okay. Drum circles. Hmm. Um, there's different types of drum circles. There's a Latin drum circle where everybody obeys every rule. Afro-Cuban music has a strict set of rules, just mm -hmm. like, say, a German counterpoint or something. Mm -hmm. You hit the wrong, you hit the right drum, but with the wrong hand, and you're outcast. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Very strict. And then there's the strictly African drum circle, which is strictly going back to your roots, and if you're not black, please do not come by. Mm -hmm. Then there's a third type of drum circle called the free drum circle, uh -huh. and I did research about this, actually. It goes all the way back in American history to almost like the... 18th century. Uh -huh. You know, in the United States of America, even today, it's still based on race to a great extent, you know. Mm -hmm. And way back then, when uh, the races are supposed to be kept totally separate, mm -hmm. whites do not mix with blacks, whites do not mix with American Indians, whites do not mix with anybody except whites of the right congregation, you know. Right, and then right. there were some people like Roger Williams who said, no, we're all Christians, we should love everybody, and so they're outcasts. And they started their own little colony. Mm. And in these little colonies, for a while they have people of all these different races, black, red, white, 
dancing around a maypole while some people play drums. And throughout American history, I did research on this, every song really is a mention of this type of free drum circle, mm-hmm. which was, where everybody was welcome. And it was always, there was a lot of religious orientation to it, you know. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it play for some of those big uh, revival meetings they had in the early 19th century. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those revival meetings were integrated, though in the South only very briefly, like after one week, the mm-hmm. preachers were told, you know, one day to leave here or, we're, or you're dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you were not, you know, they right. were serious about that, you know. Slavery was America's uh, Nazi Holocaust. I mean, the yeah. plantation, the details, there, there was, it was just that bad. So right. if you were totally, totally against the American ethos by having all the super integration, then what happened around the 1950s, it got really strong, the free drum circle, because the beatniks appeared, and mm-hmm. they started playing their little bongos and flutes. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, the Latin musicians came in, and they sort of enjoyed hanging out with the beats of Bohemians. You know, it was fun. Uh, great, great women to pick up if you were a man, you know, mm-hmm. vice versa. And, and so uh, you had these free drum circles growing up. And uh, by the 1960s, they were an integral part of all the hippie movement. You know, like mm-hmm. one time in Berkeley, a black kid was about to be arrested by three cops and probably taken away and beaten. And then a whole group of hippies surrounded him, like 80 people, and mm-hmm. said, oh, let our brother go. And while the police were trying to figure it out, he escaped. Mm-hmm. So he escaped, right? He was right. not in jail, not beaten. He escaped, and so then they had an impromptu celebration that night, and there was this guy, a black guy, who had been leading a drum circle every Sunday on UC Berkeley campus, and he was there with his two main white followers, mm-hmm. and had this big oil drum turned over, and various people would be lifted up to the oil drum and dance while we all, while they played their drums, and we mm-hmm. clapped, chanted, and so on. And then in Boston, I met another drum circle of people who actually got organized. They st- they're still in business today. Mm-hmm. They teach um, ethos like, there's room in the tribe for the man who walks backward because he can see a lion attacking you from the rear and save everybody. Mm-hmm. And they made their, all their own instruments. Mm-hmm. And, and they also were very helpful. We were led by two six-foot-six uh, black ex-Marines. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, once again, the integration thing mode comes in. Um, one time they were in Connecticut, there was a mob of white uh, early Trump supporters, you might say, who were mm-hmm. about to beat them up. And suddenly, these two very strong firefighters from New Hampshire drove by. Mm-hmm. and said, I'm not going to let that happen. So they jumped out, and these guys, I mean, these two ex-Marines were each six foot six and mm-hmm. muscular. And then they're joined by two firefighters who may not be six foot six, but are even more muscular. So they all, they all ran away. And, and then these two firefighters became very close friends with the mm-hmm. drummers. Two firefighters lay, moved to New Hampshire, mm-hmm. and they built a giant Aeolian harp. An Aeolian harp is a harp, mm-hmm. which is played by the wind. Normally, they're sort of small. This one was like 12 feet tall. tall. Mm-hmm. And there was a seven feet empty um, wooden, you know, Base where the sound came, and then the strings went up another four or five feet for the wind to blow through. Only right. sound by the wind. But uh, so we had this big jam session in the, in the firefighter's house. And when I got tired of playing, I'd walk, I could walk inside the harp, it was so big. And I walked in, a bunch of horses walked in. Okay. That big. <laughs> and so I'm listening to the wind playing the harp for these horses while my buddy's down there playing a super, you know, drum session going on. I was on for two days. Went mm-hmm. back to Boston. I saw my jazz piano teacher about who wanted to tell many more stories. And after I played around two minutes, he said, Lee, I've been trying to teach you how to play real swing for a year now. I you got it. What did you do? You spent the weekend listening to Charlie Parker. What? Practicing your head off? How did you do it? You are playing perfect swing. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, I, I had a big party with my drummers and listened to to the wind with the horses. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so. Um, All right, so. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so. Go I mean, ahead. You, yeah, you've, you've had a lot of experiences in your life. And, uh, I mean, you traveled around and, and you have an album. And uh, now you're in the Philippines. I mean, uh, yeah. 
did the did the, did the COVID catch you here? I mean, uh, or did you really plan to retire here or something like that? Well, uh, you know, I'm gay. In 1987, I got my spouse a Filipino uh, doctor, Dr. Rodel Baldos. Mm. Now, in the United States, he was not a doctor. He was working night shift as a med tech, which was very hard work. Mm. And he ran a lot of both anti-Asian and anti-gay prejudice. Mm -hmm. It didn't make life any easier. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the big, huge depression in the U.S., he got laid off, but he was mm -hmm. a doctor in the Philippines. So mm -hmm. he came back to his relatives and got a job here in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we had this house we bought in Seattle, uh -huh. and one of my students, a shark named Tim Flint, a real estate guy, mm -hmm. who uh, you wanted him to be the one negotiating on your side, not against you, because he right, was a right. He was proud of being a shark. So our house, for which we had, we still owed $120,000 on it, uh -huh. and it was the height of the housing depression, he sold it for like 250000 or something. Wow. And so with all the money left over, we totally paid off the bank. He got his big cut. We had enough for Dr. Baldos to buy this beautiful, uh, I wish it was visual, uh, mm -hmm. a beautiful, almost like a villa, beautiful house with a giant uh, yard around it mm -hmm. and we could afford mm -hmm. to hire with our social security um an ally you know a house servant in this case uh the wonderful jm june x june, mm -hmm. june, uh, uh, june mark without home he would have given me truck um <laughs> and so uh the only problem here is that there's no drummers here it's odd because in the 50s Everybody hired Filipino car drivers in those Latin bands then, but now mm -hmm. it's all karaoke, video key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. People think good, but nobody can play. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, but I remember that. So anyway, I was, I went my whole church thing. I spent 22 years playing in churches. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't mind the first church because the pastor was the son of somebody who fought in the Danish resistance in World War II. Mm. And the Danes are famous for having saved 90% of their Jewish population. Mm. Um, mm. The word came that they were about to be sent to Auschwitz. And so every Dane who had a boat from a yacht to a rowboat mm -hmm. got some Jews in it and went over across the waters and saved them all to Sweden. It's like 90, over 90% 90 of the population. Mm. So wow. when I found out the pastor, the first church was bent, his father was in the Danish tradition. I said, if I could afford it, I'd pay for you for free. And mm. I came to the Philippines, and I discovered something interesting. Always before, I'd always there was a certain amount of anti-Semitism, even you mm. know, with the even with blacks now with the uh, anti-Israel thing, you know, anti-Zionism and so right. on. Right. You know, always, and then the old-style anti-Semitism, and there was always a little flavor in the air. You didn't really notice. It was like if you live in a city where there's always a certain amount of pollution in the air, but you don't really notice it's always there. Mm -hmm. So when I came to the Philippines, I noticed something interesting. Something mm -hmm. was missing. I was breathing more, literally breathing more freely. Mm -hmm. And after I came here a little while, I discovered Filipinos love Jews mm -hmm. by the large. And, mm -hmm. and the reason I think they do is because they don't need to feel guilty about World War II because President Hazon actually went out of his way to illegally save a thousand Jews. They would have done more if they'd been able to mm. and bring them to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And there's a monument in Israel made by a Filipino sculptor in honor of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so every time when other people talk about the Jews in World War II, they feel guilty. Filipinos can stick their chest out and say, hey, we were heroes, you mm -hmm. know? And I notice in all the bookstores here, there are huge quantity of books about Israel and Zionism and the Holocaust. You know, you think you're living in Tel Aviv or something. You went to a bookstore here. <laughs> and, and, and the church I played here was just as what I call philo-Semitic, in other words, loving Jews, as the church I played with the Danish pastor back in uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm totally happy playing in those types of those churches. And actually... Because I always had, from the very beginning, a sort of a religious orientation. The mm -hmm. drum circle was always religious. You know, it was a good mm -hmm. chance that this guy, one black drummer named Osiris, he pointed his hand up into the pointing of the sky, meaning this jam, this one up to the Lord, you know. Mm -hmm. So I've 
always been a religious guy. And uh, uh, there's only one synagogue here in the whole Philippines, unfortunately. And it's not my brand of Judaism. It's very orthodox, whereas I'm liberal. But, you know, it's just, it's just the only one in town, so to speak. They welcome anybody who's Jewish to be there. Right. It's a heck of a drive, and of course, it's out now with the quarantine. But I, well, I can make it. I try to make it like once every, once every two months. Mm. It's a four-hour drive round trip, so a little heavy, but but it's still wonderful. And I see in that synagogue a final point. All these kids who are from Israeli Filipino families. Mm. Israelis come here, usually marry a Filipina, and mm. then they raise their kids with Filipino culture and everything, but in the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. And they are strong, smart looking. You know, the Filipinos, you know, your history, they were always fighting against the colonialists. The first colonialist ever killed was old, uh, was over there by uh, Lapu Lapu, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Right down the jail, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, Lapu Lapu killed uh, the first uh, colonialist tried to take over the Philippines. And of course, Israelis fought the people trying to take over them. And so you got two tough people interbreeding. I look at these Filipino Israeli kids and I think, man, this is this is Hitler's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> these are the toughest truths you could imagine. Now with that Filipino thing. And uh, and they also have wonderful food there, Filipino and Israeli. But right. unfortunately I haven't been able to go since the lockdown, I'm hoping mm. looking forward to going back. So that's in brief that's pretty much my story. Okay. And on the Blog, I will have a link which will take you to my YouTube site to where there's all 53 video links and you can help yourself. All right, okay. <laughs> Great. And, uh, you know, Lee, thank you very much for sharing your story. It's, I, I know there are well, a lot more, I know you have a lot more to tell. I mean, you've lived a full life and uh, unfortunately we don't, don't have that much time. So, you know, thank you for being on. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Alex. Thank you for taking me. All right, great. Okay, so everyone, check out Lee Cronbach and his YouTube site. The link is on the blog, on the companion blog uh, that comes through this interview. And also go right ahead and hit the subscribe button to check out all the people and stories we have on this channel. So we'll catch you guys next time on Author Story, the home of authors and people with stories that matter. Thank you very much. Okay. Shalom, Bangi. <laughs>